Hello everyone. Welcome to the inaugural webinar to the wider webinar series. How is COVID-19 changing development? At UNI Wider, we are doing our best to respond and adapt to the coronavirus pandemic. This is meant reorienting our research focus, changing how we facilitate knowledge exchange. We are pleased to launch this new online webinar series, which features a lineup of eminent researchers and development specialists working on this, on this issue. They will present new research on the implications they foresee of COVID-19, the global development efforts, and the economic, political, and social impacts for the Global South. Our first speaker in the wider webinar series is Professor Annie Sumner, a world-leading scholar on global poverty and inequality. Professor Sumner will be speaking on COVID-19, a long crisis of the new normal in developing countries. In particular, they will be speaking on the implications of the pandemic of global poverty. Professor Andy Sumner is a professor of international development at King's College London. He's a director of the Economic and Social Research Council's Global Challenges Strategic Research Network on Global Poverty and Inequality Dynamics, and a non resident senior research fellow of UNI Wider. He also has holds associate positions at the University of Oxford, the Center for Global Development, and at Patanjan University in Indonesia. We also have a distinguished discussant for the webinar today, Professor Arif Yusuf. Arif Yusuf will speak for the Indonesian experience about poverty in the wake of the pandemic. Arif Yusuf is a professor of economics at the Department of Economics, Parja Jaran University, Indonesia, visiting professor at the Department of International Development, King's College, London, honorary senior lecturer at the Crawford School of Public Policy, also National University, and also a non resident senior research fellow at the UniWider. Now, in 2015, all UN member states adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which provided a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. At its heart were the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which were an urgent call for action by all countries develop and developing in a global partnership. The first of the SDGs, SDG 1, was to end poverty in all its forms everywhere. Even before the onset of the pandemic, the world was not on track to end poverty by 2030. Though the global poverty rate had fallen from 36% in 1990 to 8.6% in 2018, poverty was expected to be 6% in 2030. So the goal of zero poverty would not have been reached. Professor Sun will provide an assessment of how much of an impact the pandemic will have on global poverty and SDG 1 in his talk. Now to a few logistical issues. First, you should type in your questions using the Q&A feature that you see in front of your screen. My colleague Ruby Richardson will ask these questions on your behalf to Andy Sumner and Arif Yusuf at the end of their presentations. Please keep on sending these questions as you think of them and we'll collect them and we'll ask them at the end of the presentations. Also time permitting, you may also use the raise hand feature and ask a question live when asked to do so by us. I should also note that the webinar will be recorded and shared later on our YouTube channel afterwards. I'm now pleased to invite Andy Sumner to present in the webinar. Andy Sumner will speak for 30 minutes, followed by a discussion by Arif Yusuf for 15 minutes, which leaves about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end. Andy, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first ever uh, UNU wider uh, webinar. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, be talking about the research that we've been involved, we've been doing, uh, published by WIDER, <clears throat> on the potential poverty impact of the crisis. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the wider implications about what uh, COVID could mean for development uh, and how we need to sort of think through some of these bigger questions looking ahead. So in terms of an introduction, I think the first thing to say is <clears throat> there's a lot of attention on one pandemic, the COVID pandemic, but potentially there's a second pandemic, a poverty pandemic that's getting much less attention but to date, but, but I think that attention is now gonna be rising. Here's some of the headlines that we've come to so far, and then I'll talk through a bit of the research. First of all, our estimate is that somewhere between 100 million and 500 million people, half a billion people, could fall into poverty during, due to the poverty pandemic following COVID. So why is that? 
That's because a lot of people live just above the poverty line. Every 10 cents is 100 million people moving up from 190 upwards. So this could mean the reversal of 10 years of global poverty reduction and 30 years poverty reduction in sub-Saharan Africa. But crucially, it depends on what the income shock is and it depends what governments do. So what we're going to do now is introduce the webinar poll. Uh, Ruby's going to put the poll up, I think, next. There you go. So you have one minute, obviously a very big question to answer in one minute. Basically, in one minute, you have to decide whether COVID will be over in five years, less than five years. When do you think the COVID-19 crisis will end in developing countries? Less than five years, five to 10 years, or never, it's the new normal. And I'll return to that poll uh, later on. So let me tell you a bit about the research we've been doing. So first of all, let me, let me set a bit of context. I mentioned two pandemics, and let's compare them a little bit at the outset. First of all, you can think about the global attention, uh, the impact, the critical cases, how to reduce the transmission and the policy. So if you think of COVID, there's a lot of attention, enormous amount of global attention on COVID, yet on poverty, there's initially very little. And actually now I think that's rising as it becomes clear that there will be a poverty impact. In terms of COVID, the impact is really about the numbers versus coping capacity of health systems uh, as one of the most important factors. In terms of poverty, the impact is really about very small losses have a very high impact near the poverty line. Losses of even 10 or 20 cents can make a very big difference to people's livelihoods. So when you think about the critical cases, if we think 4 million infections so far and rising from COVID, that's a lot. Uh, if you assume a 50% hospitalization of 2 million, uh, then, uh, then um, you still have a lot of people and that's rising. And yet, if you think about the poverty impact, our estimates of the potential poverty impact could be anywhere between 100 million and 600 million people. So clearly there's uh, a, an important part of the discussion we need to be having. And then that points us towards the real tension here. One of the ways, the, the quickest way to control COVID is a lockdown. Whereas the quickest way to address the poverty impact is really to open up and to think about other social safety nets to accompany that. So the, the policy in terms of vaccine, hopefully, and obviously the vaccine is, the, is going to be the big question over the next few years, is either a lockdown, test trace, or when we think about poverty, we need to think about global funds, global solidarity funds, and national safety nets. I'll say a bit about the research we've been doing, and then I'll turn to some of the broader issues I think COVID raises for development. So, so we, we estimated the poverty impact of COVID. What we did was we looked at different income contractions to household income. Uh, some of its income, some of its consumption, depending what data is available for each country. We used the World Bank's PovCalNet data set. We modeled three scenarios of 5%, 10% and a 20% income hit. We captured this by increasing the value of the poverty line. Uh, so you take the poverty line and then you add five or 10 or 20% to see how many people are vulnerable of falling back into poverty. Uh, uh, and how that differs in each country. At the moment, we've done global and regional estimates, and we're currently working on national estimates, and so we're expecting a follow-up paper uh, in June. We use the World Bank's three poverty lines for developing countries, 190, 320, 550. These are the average for low-income countries, middle in lower middle-income countries, and upper middle-income countries. So what did we find? So here's some of the headlines. If you take a 5% income contraction, that would imply an additional number of people living in poverty of almost 85 million at the 190 global poverty line. If you take the higher lines, it implies larger numbers. At the other end of the spectrum, if you look at a 20% income contraction, you have, much, of course, much higher numbers of people who could potentially fall into poverty, somewhere between 400 million and perhaps as close as 600 million. Um, depending on the poverty line you take. And then the graphs at the bottom show the 5% hit, the 10% hit, and the 20% hit, and how it affects the different uh, poverty lines over time. And what you can see is we've plotted poverty based on the official data from 1990 up to just before the crisis. And then we've modeled our different hits uh, from uh, for the crisis up to 2020. And there's a few things that are probably just worth noting. I mean, one is, I think we don't really realize that actually, when you take higher poverty lines, much more of the global population are living in day-to-day -day poverty. 
If you take a poverty line of $5.50, which is close to many Latin American national poverty lines, then you might even have half the population of the planet living in poverty. I think in a way we focus a lot on the $1.90 and we forget actually that beyond that, poverty doesn't suddenly disappear at $1.91. People move out of poverty very slowly and it's not one big uh, jump into a prosperous lifestyle. So where would those new people, those new poor people live? Actually, if you take the lower poverty lines, you tend to find uh, the new poor would be concentrated in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, within those, there's uh, very large populous countries. Of course, India's numbers dominate South Asia. And in Africa, Nigeria is a very important part of the Sub-Saharan African poverty numbers amongst other countries. But then as you move up poverty line, because of the different consumption structure in different parts of the world, if you were to take higher poverty lines, there's a much larger proportion in East Asia, uh, particularly at the $5.50 line. So I think that's worth emphasizing that the poverty line you take tends to, to, tends to tell the picture depending on different parts of the world. And if you look at the regions of the world, here we have the poverty headcount from 1990 onwards and then our projection to 2020 based on those different uh, scenarios, 5%, uh, 10%, 20% income contraction. And again, $1.90, $3.20, $5.50 poverty lines. You can see, first of all, that there's a very clear impact uh, in terms of the, the kind of a, a poverty boomerang uh, in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, as people who have moved above the poverty line may well fall back under it because of COVID, uh, if there's income shocks, uh, 5, 10 or 20%. We also see quite a significant impact in Middle East and North Africa. And so I think one, one issue that will be important over the coming years is the social unrest that this may unleash uh, and probably the impact on politics uh, of having a very large number of people suddenly uh, facing an income shock and how that might affect different political uh, settlements around the world. Let me say a little bit about comparing our study to two other studies that exist uh, for, uh, for comparison. There's a study by Nick Lee uh, at DFID, a DFID internal paper, and there's also a World Bank blog by Amala et al. Those use different methodologies and they come out with slightly different findings, but not hugely different to, to, the, to what we found. And I can explain, explain why they're different. And I'd also like to say a few words about their methodology and why I'm cautious about using IMF growth forecasts. So the Lee paper uses the growth semi-elasticity semi -elasticity of poverty. That's the relationship between GDP and the percentage point change in poverty uh, historically, and then applies the GDP rates from the IMF growth forecast. The Marla paper is, is somewhat similar. It uses the IMF forecast, but it simply uh, uses the contraction to interplay from household surveys. And so you end up with uh, estimates that are almost 62 million or 72 million, uh, close to our 85 million. The reason I think ours is slightly higher, unfortunately, they didn't make estimates for the higher poverty lines, so just the 190. First of all, I think there's slightly different starting points in terms of the baseline assumed for poverty prior to the crisis. Secondly, I think IMF growth forecasts are really um, still rather, rather optimistic. So in the 10 countries that dominate global poverty, two thirds of global poverty is in 10 countries, the forecast there is for a, a GDP contraction per capita of minus two. I think two or three months of lockdown, a minus two GDP contraction is probably over optimistic. And also we'd expect um, the household consumption contraction to be higher amongst the poor and near poor than a GDP contraction on, on the average population. I think there's also two or three other reasons why I'm very cautious about IMF growth forecast. I mean, first of all, there's seven or more recent studies trying to assess the accuracy after, uh, after the event of IMF forecasts. The IMF tends to be optimistic. Um, that's partly because understandably the IMF doesn't want to create a sense that things are gonna be really bad, I think. Um, I think there's also an issue that, in fact, the, the, the IMF's own impact evaluation department found that the forecasts tend to be very um, optimistic about shallow recessions rather than deep recessions. And the IMF forecasts around the global financial crisis were very, very out. So I think 
I think the, the IMF growth forecasts are good if you're looking at sort of five years, which is usually what they're made for. But to estimate poverty in, on the next year on GDP forecast it makes me a little bit a little bit cautious. So I'm not saying studies are wrong. Of course, no one knows at this stage. Um, but I'm saying I, I, we, we considered the option and we decided to go for the, the contractions that we used. Let me turn next to some broader issues. First, whether we're talking about a health or an economic crisis and the impact of COVID, and then to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the issues beyond that. I mean, first of all, I think it's fair to say developing countries generally have a lower proportion of people over the age of 70. So one would think, and I think this is a, a, a fair argument, that the economic shock may be more significant than the health shock. However, Developing countries often have weaker health systems. There's evidence that COVID mortality and morbidity rates are linked to poverty, ethnicity, pollution, malnutrition. All of these things are prevalent in some developing countries. There's also very strong links to hypertension and to diabetes. Of course, that's an issue for some middle income countries in particular. There's also unknown links to tuberculosis, HIV, chronic malaria, and respiratory problems. Almost a billion people cook indoors, and that creates respiratory uh, uh, issues. And I think those are some of the things that COVID will interact with, and we'll see that over the next few years. All of this raises a question for me, which is whether a lockdown is the only option, and also uh, whether it's even feasible in high-density areas or in areas where there's no income or so, no social safety net, how people are, people are going to be faced with this choice of, do I, do, do I go hungry uh, or do I run the risk? It's, it's fine for people with um, in higher up the income distribution to work at home and work on the internet, but that's not possible for many people who work in the informal sector or in the poorer parts of society in, in developing countries and in rich countries. And there's a very interesting study by Dingle and Newman that finds only 5% of people in Mozambique could work at home, 25% in, in Mexico, where it's 40% in the US or Finland. So clearly there's an issue here, I think, about whether the lockdown is feasible uh, and what it will actually achieve. Then there's the question of whether this is a long crisis or a new normal. Clearly the most important thing, and this seems to be very widely accepted, is until there's a vaccine, it's very difficult to see uh, how the future is going to uh, unravel. So at the moment, there are no vaccines for any coronaviruses, and there's no guarantee of immunity after infection, although the recent evidence from South Korea is more positive about that. It raises the question of what if there's no vaccine or a vaccine that's less than 100% effective? Most vaccines we have are not 100% effective. Um, we know that the pandemic will proceed in waves. Uh, WHO talks of perhaps six to 10 waves. Even if a vaccine is discovered, rolling out to an entire population of almost 8 billion is likely to take five or 10 years based on other vaccination rollouts. And then of course, there's no guarantee that every government is gonna fund this publicly and whether sometimes people might have to pay or might not get the vaccination at all. Underlying this, I think, is COVID could act as a super accelerator of existing changes. The one issue is many people working remotely amongst uh, white collar jobs, particularly in OECD countries. It will become clear to private companies in particular that those jobs could be done in places like India, perhaps at a much lower labor cost. Uh, this is where uh, Baldwin talk, Richard Baldwin talks about telemigrating and tradable services as the new future for developing countries. I think it's also possible some of the resistance to automation uh, uh, around, particularly around politics and people's concerns uh, may be overridden by health concerns. So I think that's an issue as well. So let me say some policy questions that are arising and then I'll turn to conclusions and hand over to Arif. So I think there's a set of policy questions, global, national, all of these depend on the length of the crisis. And then something that we're, no one's really discussing yet is new public and private debt. Many of the world's largest companies are borrowing billions of dollars. And so even very large companies are going to have to think about how the money will be paid back eventually. On the global question side, there's issues about the Global Solidarity Fund, uh, ODA, but also technical assistance may be very fundamental in the world's poorest countries. There's obviously questions about the role of public goods around health, vaccinations, a Global Solidarity Fund for the vaccine, perhaps. There's even questions about a new Bretton Woods. Is this an opportunity to rethink the global system to be fairer, more equitable? 
The IMF already has requests for funds from over 100 developing countries. That shows you the extent of what's unfolding as we speak. At the national level, the good news is um, a lot of social safety nets are already being initiated or expanded. Uh, Hugo Gentilini at the World Bank is doing very good work tracking on a weekly basis. I think 171 developing countries, sorry, 171 countries now have uh, COVID-related safety net programs. I think we also need to think about pay to stay at home, universal basic income perhaps, pay to test, pay to get people tested. The good news is global oil prices are rather low at the moment, which might mean that some of the large, enormous trillion dollar uh, fossil fuel, regressive fossil fuel subsidies that go into these cheap petrol at the pump in many countries could actually be transferred to poverty transfers given that oil prices are, are relatively low. I mean, all of these questions really depend on how long the crisis is and when the vaccine, if it appears, appears. I think potentially there's an opportunity to rethink the global architecture. Maybe we need a new global development architecture where everyone pays in, all countries, and then countries are paid out according to need. There's a paper by Glennie, uh, myself, uh, and others that discusses this in, in a wider working paper recently. And then I mentioned briefly the public debt. Of course, it's the private debt of, of not only individuals, but companies, but also the private debt. I think developing countries will lose export income, remittance income, extractive income, tourism income, capital flows, and be faced with higher spending. Does that mean the future's austerity, or does it mean higher taxes? And then on whom? Is it taxes on the rich? Is it taxes on capital? I think many of these policy questions are only starting to be put on the table. And the social safety net one seems to be moving quite quickly. Whether it's enough uh, is another question, but certainly governments are, are starting to move because of the consequences of not uh, putting place safety nets. Let me make some conclusions. I think, first of all, the poverty impact of the crisis is likely to be substantial. It's difficult to see how it wouldn't be. Even in our lowest case scenario and the other studies, it may be around 100 million or something like that. Then clearly it comes down to questions of if and when a vaccine is available, how effective it is, who gets it, who does and who pays, that will decide how global poverty evolves over the next 10 years. I think there's three scenarios, at least three scenarios. One is a kind of best case. There's a 100% effective vaccine in the next two years. Governments around the world commit to publicly funded rollout. Even then it could take five or 10 years to vaccinate. So clearly the what appears to be a temporary poverty impact may be long, even in the best case scenario. There's a kind of new normal case that's worrying in the sense that there might be a vaccine, but then some people will get it, some people won't. There might be a separation of the vaccinated and unvaccinated, a kind of new apartheid between those who have immunity passports and those who don't have that. That might mean different labour markets, it might mean freedom of movement for those who have the vaccine or can afford it, and those who can't would have different citizen rights. And then, of course, there's the long crisis, which is a bit like where we are now, which is maybe there's no vaccine. There's no vaccine for other coronaviruses. Maybe there'll be a partially affected one that will be not that much different from where we are now. Maybe there'll be better drug treatments. Maybe we'll go in waves and each country will go in waves of COVID until immunity levels rise sufficiently to prevent future transmission. That would be a very sort of stark future for global poverty. Uh, and so I think these are the, some of the questions we need to start thinking about um, over the ne next few months. Thank you. Just before we hand over to Arif, I just wanted to also share with you, Andy, the, uh, the results here of the poll as well. Um, so I think at the beginning of your talk, we can see that uh, about half of the people actually thought that uh, the crisis would end in the next five years. So I think you've really given us uh, something to think about there. Definitely. That's really interesting. What I noticed when the poll was happening um, is um, a lot of people clicked less than five years first of all, and that went up to 90% and it suddenly dropped down. It made me think whether people, can people shift their vote or once you voted, you voted? Uh, I think people can shift, but uh, I think it was also people maybe were early on quite confident with themselves and then thought about it a bit more and mm. thought, maybe this is a trick question. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Arif. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I hope that uh, the country case 
uh, of Indonesia may complement uh, what Andy has just presented. So basically, uh, I'm going to talk about three things. The first is a brief of headline about what happening in Indonesia in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I'm going to talk about this impact on some economic uh, indicators and also some government policy responses. And then I also would like to share my thought uh, into something slightly methodological, which is translating the economic growth into property impact, but also talking a little bit more about how the distributions of the impact, I mean, within country distributions of the impact, also acknowledging that there are some kind of non-natural distribution of impact that may affect uh, some sort of the magnitude of how the crisis can turn into poverty. So in Indonesia today, uh, we already reported around 14,000 something case and 100 more already more than 1,000 dead. So this is uh, between the number is between India and, 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 and Thailand in terms of the uh, cases. However, the number also need to be cautious about it because Indonesian testing rate and its under reporting is actually among the world world lowest, quite very low. Uh, you can see that we are low compared to our neighbors in terms of the number of tests per thousand people there. Uh, and also, I just would like to share some worrying uh, scenarios that was published by the now famous uh, center uh, in Imperial College, which actually still give us a risk of catastrophic number of death, yeah? simply because we have a quite large number of population too. And there is a bit worry too, because uh, compared to other country in the region, uh, our containment measure uh, is a little bit softer version of what have been other countries doing. For example, in India, uh, they, they are more strict uh, compared to Indonesia or even uh, most of the Indonesian case. In Jakarta is a bit okay, but it's a really, it's actually a softer version of lockdown. So still uh, there. Now let me talk about the economic impact. So the growth, economic growth this year is projected uh, between the worst scenario minus 3.5 is from coming from the World Bank. And then as you may expect, the most optimistic scenario is the one coming from the Ministry of Finance, which is 2.3%. So even though Ministry of Finance still has uh, opened this possibility of minus um, 0.4. And also the ad, it's quite heterogeneous, uh, the forecast, but what is interesting is how, how, how is the profile of the recovery. So it's also varies. Yeah? Some, some institution like uh, Oxford Economic or IMF is very pessimistic about the V-shape, but some other not. Economic Intelligence Unit, for example, uh, the, the profile will look like you said, which is the economic growth in 2021 and beyond will still be normal 5% uh, like, like we used to be, which is, which is not enough to, 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 for, for rebound. And we actually uh, have responded, the government has responded uh, with some kind of fiscal stimulus. It's a budget that is, uh, So it's increased budget deficit from what is allowed normally in the constitution, which is 2.5%, now can be up to five or, uh, more than 5%. Uh, and then with that money, we allocate around $27 billion, 2.5% for the GDP, which can be spent for various uh, items, like various uh, spending, like such as social assistance, and then health spending, and also uh, industry support in order to avoid, uh, one of them is in order to avoid uh, massive layoff. Yeah? And then of course, the most important one is I think social assistance. And here is where, uh, where the matter is a bit delicate. Why? Because uh, here, for example, the, the last uh, this data suggests Indonesia is actually 
among close to 70% of Indonesian actually either poor or vulnerable. So this is among the highest in the region, 68% of Indonesian is either uh, poor or vulnerable. So among, so this is the word. So this thing will not only make our health system under pressure, but will make our social uh, safety net system is heavily under pressure because COVID, because with 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 the heavy with the intensive vulnerability, it means there's a little bit of shocks, and these people have to be protected and start to be as many. As many. So I can see that this is how the government respond. It's quite interesting. Why? Because actually uh, we here add extra almost 30% of, of additional uh, social assistance, normally around 200 trillion rupiah. Now, now it was increased yeah, by 56 trillion rupiah. And what is interesting is this is not only given to the poor by national standard. The poor national standard is only this color. Here is this color. So this is the second decile, third decile, fourth decile, five decile, even six decile will be the beneficiary of this extra. So can you can you imagine how Indonesian social safety net system now is really under pressure because we have to protect all these people too. And then as you can see that most of them are in the form of this, for example, special cash transfer. This is very special cash transfer for COVID, which actually targeted the fourth or fifth decile. And this is targeted four to six decile, and this also targeted to five or six decile. Six decile something that has never been done before. So this is what I say that we 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 actually have quite good uh, improvement in the system of social safety net uh, after so many reform for the last maybe ten years, yeah. But now this system is under heavy test. So so maybe this is also a blessing in disguise. So, so we can learn from this uh, in order to make an improvement in the future. So the impact on poverty is also varies. There are already several studies, uh, but it impact, but more or less, if I have, if I may uh, you know, have an opinion is uh, in compar comparable to what Andy suggests, but uh, Andy, is specific on uh, 1.9 purchasing power, which is uh, international property line, but this is a national property line. But Indonesian national property line is actually not so much different than than than, than extreme property line, if if we want to look it that way. So the impact on poverty is estimated to increase by the most uh, positive uh, positive or Optimistic scenario is 0.44% to 3.2%. It's translated into actually 1.2 million to, to almost 9 million people. And uh, the method more or less, some of them uh, using the similar method at Andy, which is assuming non-neutral, oh, sorry, neutral distributional impact. Uh, some of them, for example, Smeru, they, and use past uh, pattern of uh, crisis in order to see the impact which is different or heterogeneous between group of people. ADB, for example, using some sort of modeling where, where actually uh, I'm involved myself there. So, however, the impact on poverty actually uh, will be also affected by 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 the incidents, how this effect of the crisis uh, created by COVID nineteen impact differently across different part of the population. So now we are talking about things beyond uh, that. I hope that I can complement what Andy uh, discussed before, which is the distributional impact or even the economic impact, the impact of the COVID pandemic on within country distribution. And in the literature, actually, the the theory or 
uh, the the theory varies. Yeah? Uh, maybe some many of you uh, recognize this book by Walter Skadel, which say that actually pandemic may create a labor shortage, so that will increase the price of labor. Uh, I mean the labor, the remaining labor. So uh, pandemic uh, seems uh, most likely to be equalizing. Uh, and also another study by, by the recently by Barrow and, 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 and colleague, which suggested actually using Spanish flu as the example or the case study, actually the pandemic decreased return on stock. Yet those three, those two uh, cases is actually in the past where the pandemic is a lot more deadly than I think what will be today. So the, the different will be the, uh, the, the, the effect will be different. And uh, there are others very new study by IMF uh, researchers, Porcery and colleague, which suggest actually otherwise. Uh, based on the pandemic for the past two decades, actually there is a tendency that actually pandemic may actually uh, inequalizing. And you can have so then uh, the the shape I think of the growth incident curve uh, that will eventually have the effect on the distributional effect of the COVID depend on various factors. Yeah? Uh, first, I think uh, now we're we're not we're not talking about the distributional effect of pandemic per se, yeah? but I think what matters more is the distributional effect of the containment, which actually vary widely by uh, by countries because it depends on various factor. There is country specific, the resources and things like that, and but most likely crisis will hit everyone, so the GIC will actually be below zero, unlikely to create labor shortage. Yeah, because of the modern medicine now is different than the past, uh, but also it may affect may have some kind of scaring effect. Uh, it precaution saving that may actually income equalizing, uh, and yet lockdown effect uh, most likely, at least in the case of Indonesia, yeah, um, predominantly predominantly urban, so agriculture might be hit less, might be hit less, sorry. Uh, services like transport and travel will be the worst hit. Uh, in Indonesia, for the last ten years, its service actually tend to be income inequalizing. So the the, the income inequalizing, so the the big hit to the sector will have the opposite effect. Uh, manufacturing will be is labor intensive, so it will be the hardest hit. Uh, yet urban poor and national middle class, it will be hard. That's at least in Indonesia. Uh, region and sector which heavily depended on tourism will be hard, hit hardest. Uh, actually, in Bali, in Indonesia, for example, uh, we didn't even impose lockdown. It's already locked down naturally because there's no activity at all. 90% of the activity in Bali are from uh, tourism. So we don't need any presidential decree or governor decree to do the lockdown. They already locked down. Uh, and tourism actually has extensive repercussion effect, especially in Bali. Informal sector lockdown is very hard to enforce. So it, it will be difficult to enforce because if, if, they, if they follow the lockdown, they won't, they won't leave. So, so informal activity is sustained only on daily basis. So lockdown or not lockdown, they will, they will do it. They will do their own activity. Yes, there is social safety net, which is matter, but in many developing countries, especially like Indonesia, uh, you know that the fiscal space is limited. And for country like Indonesia, even Indonesian geography is unique. So you have, uh, you know, like quite big gap yeah, in terms of the development outcome across the island. So they also have something unique to the Indonesia. So, so uh, in all, it's a bit hard to predict yeah, to what kind of the uh, distributional impact of this COVID crisis in Indonesia, but but it could be both. It could be like similar to the 97, 98 crisis, yeah, which is actually income uh, equalizing, as I as I will try to show you. So, uh, a sectoral impact is one of the key factor that will determine the the you know the the distributional effect. 
and then this is uh, the preliminary analysis that, uh, that I did for ADB uh, last week or uh, last two weeks using CGE model actually which show that uh, through various mechanisms that actually the sector that will be affected by by this crisis is mostly manufacturing and then to some extent services uh, so and 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 this is confirmed by by for example by by economists in, in, in intelligent unit forecast, which suggests that uh, industry and service will be the, the hardest hit, but agriculture will be a lot less. So just, just for illustrative purpose, I, 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 try, I, I try to create or to set up a micro, -analyze, micro simulation analysis using uh, the National Association of Survey data. Uh, just to take into account the sectoral bias uh, that was, uh, you know, guided by these two studies uh, by representing household expenditure by human capital of the household head, which one of them here, we can identify the sector where all this household depended on. So for example, then using this estimate of the model, I illustrate that in Indonesia, if all this 4.0% reduction in growth is contributed by agricultural sector only, this will be the growth incidence. It will be income in equalizing. But if this 4.0% reduction in growth is contributed by service sector only, this will be <clears throat> this will be in, uh, income equalizing, this will be income inequalizing. But this also tend to be income equalizing. So, so sector matters. So now what if I plug this just for illustrative purpose, what if I plug this, this scheme or this characteristic of this 2020 forecast by AEU, which is also supported by my own analysis here to, the, to this model. And this is the result. So this is the result. So it's tend to be income equalizing. So the, the rich will be hit harder than the poor. And of course, there will have an implication on how we calculate the impact of, on poverty. Uh, it's not much, but still matter. So for example, if you assume distribution natural, so the impact on poverty will be 1.3% additional or 3.6 million people. But with uh, this profile, it will be a bit softened, yeah. So into 0.9 percent or 2.5 million. However, with sectoral bias, for example, I can also pinpoint, unlike the distribution natural, which is there's no impact on Gini coefficient, I can still have a guess of uh, what kind of what is the impact of this 2020 projection, which is caused by COVID mostly, uh, have on Gini coefficient, which is actually slightly income uh, equalizing. Okay, so this is my final remark. So Indonesia is still struggling to mitigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Serious health fatality is still remain. Uh, Indonesia is a good example of country where, where it has high profile vulnerability. So in this case that we are not only concerned about the collapse of the health system, but also the concern about the collapse of the social safety net system. It is actually a good thing for Indonesia because we already have been doing reform and progress in the improvement of the social safety net. Now the system is under heavy test. So for future improvement, it is a good thing. Uh, and then the, using uh, my analysis about poverty impact, uh, 2.5 million uh, at least will become poor. And this is actually equivalent to three years reduction, not decades like what Andy said, but this is for Indonesia, three years reduction. Uh, about distributional effect of COVID-19, uh, well, because the analysis is still preliminary, so still uncertain, but at least so far, my analysis suggests that it may be, maybe tend to reduce inequality slightly. And the last I would like to introduce, because this is unprecedented, uh, situation and also will invite some unprecedented research agenda. So one of them is what not many people have talked about yet is the growth incidence, not the, the impact of the COVID in short term, 
but the broad incidence of the economic recovery. I think that also matter because not only poverty uh, is the biggest issue in SDGs, yeah, but also inequality is also the biggest issue in, in SDG. So I think that's that's what I can share. Uh, I, I I return to Kunal. Uh, thank you, Andy and Ari, for a very interesting presentation. So we have a few questions already, and I'm going to ask Ruby Richardson to ask these questions uh, to you. Thank, thank you, you very much, Kunal, and uh, thank you both very much for your uh, wonderful presentations today. So we've already got a few questions coming through on the Q&A. For anybody who is watching who has a question, please use the Q&A button down below. Um, and uh, once we answer the questions as well, then uh, we will share each answer so that everybody can see as well. Uh, so one here, let's see what we've got. Um, so interesting one here to start with. I will just mention that we've got 15 minutes, so we'll try and keep these fairly short if possible. So climate change uh, is actually improving given some of the circumstances that are in place uh, to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So this is, uh, this is actually helping SDG 13, 14 and 15 in a positive direction. Uh, so do you see this as sort of having positive impacts on health and what are your uh, comments on how it may impact some of the other SDGs as well, other than uh, and obviously taking into consideration the potential poverty increases? Um, sh should I go first? Um, yeah. So, um, well, I mean, of course, it's a very, it's uh, uh, an unexpected um, or some kind of silver lining that there's a, a, a climate benefit to what's happening. Um, I guess my hope is that uh, the sheer impact of what's happening uh, makes people think a bit more uh, about overconsumption in the north. Uh, as well as, as consumption in the South, particularly the sort of uh, more sustainable forms of consumption. And so I'm not sure whether um, there'll be a, a permanent impact on, on the climate change uh, after this, because I, but it, it presumably um, it's made people stop and, and think a little bit, particularly those who have um, in policy circles. Um, that maybe there's an opportunity now. As I mean, when I mentioned, maybe the crisis is, is presents an opportunity to think about the global architecture. I mean, obviously, climate would be centred to thinking about or rethinking the global ar architecture around that. Thank you. Um, so another one that came up here, and I think it was uh, there was an interesting element added to this with Arif's presentation as well is uh, Andy for your estimations uh, do these estimations on poverty take into account uh, any instant government assistance so for example uh, during the pandemic in some countries like Thailand the amount of money that is uh, that is available is greater than the level of the poverty line so since the poverty rate is measured by using expenditure uh, may the effect on poverty be smaller um, could we have several different scenarios, perhaps based on how governments in developing countries are addressing the problem through direct cash transfers? Yeah, okay. So, uh, you go for it, Arif. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I think I, I'm not, I don't really know exactly in Thailand, uh, but yet in Indonesia, uh, I think uh, the, it's not, it's not the, the result of the analysis is only plugging some number from other people's forecast through growth. So it so it's not necessarily already accounting for the impact of the government assistance. But uh, I will revising that. But the analysis you know, done, done by other institutions like ADB already take into account of that. And I did also other STS anal analysis, which actually suggests that uh, in terms of the economic growth, the stimulus that Indonesia introduced uh, is still far from mitigating the, the recession, of course, because uh, the 25 billion, uh, 25 billion, uh, yeah, the, 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 the 405, 405 trillion dollar Europea is actually some coming from the, the new deficit, but most is actually from reallocation from other spending. 
Uh, and as you can see from my slides before, actually the addition of the social assistant is only 28% of the existing. Uh, so, so the impact on poverty, of course, it won't, it won't, uh, won't have, uh, you know, like uh, full compensations of the impact. And also many of the money actually goes to non-poor by national definition. Right? So it means actually this, this, this vulnerable poor people, they won't become poor by national standard. They just, they just has less utility, less welfare. So we are given them we are giving them some compensation so they are still at least not get as much as hardship that they get, not necessarily they're becoming poor. So the statistics of the poverty is may or may not be affected by this because they are touching uh, even the six deciles of the distribution. So so that's so that's what uh, so my 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 guess is it won't it won't it far from enough. Yeah? To, to mitigate the impact of poverty. And then using poverty line as a guide or not that the poverty will be impacted, it's not necessarily giving us a clue of how poverty will keep will up and down because many of the money goes even to people beyond the poverty line. So that's what I might my, 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 uh, comment on that. Thank you. Did you have something you would like to add to that as well, Andy? Uh, so our, our global and regional estimates did not take account of government assistance because it's, it's not possible in the, the way we do it. You need the kind of CGE model that a reef has. Um, it's possible, I suppose, we could come up with some assumptions. It strikes me that um, some of the governments in East Asia, after they faced a very severe crisis in 97, 98, introduced social safety nets. And so in a way, those countries have seen uh, a very real kind of um, how this how this can play out previously uh, and of course in 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 uh, in that period there were very large poverty impacts across east asia and very large political impacts as a consequence um i think if if governments are providing money that's equivalent or greater than the public line that's that's very good news um and i think um we can have a think about modeling some of these different scenarios in, in future work. Um, it does require um, a global model more like um, IFPRI uh, and um, there's one at the Australian National University that the ILO have used, uh, which would be similar to the approach that um, Arif has taken so far. Um, so that, I think that's, that's the answer on that one. Thank you very much. Uh, we've also got a question here from, from Eva, who's actually uh, in our Mozambique team. And uh, she says that both presentations focused on the income effects. What about food shortages, food price spikes, uh, and those sorts of things? Are they captured indirectly or would they potentially exacerbate the effects? Or could they work against the equalizing effect that Arif was talking about as well? I think I think the the effect if it's if it's uh, you know if it's work through market uh, that is already taken into account in most most of the modeling analysis as well. In particular, the thing that I did yeah uh, in terms of the general equilibrium modeling. Well, uh, but what I think is more interesting is other related question that I've been reading is about this is not necessarily an economic issues, but this is necessary is also a public health issue. So, should, 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 should we consider also public health issues here? Uh, well, of course, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty strongly actually in the beginning of the crisis in Indonesia, I was pretty strongly uh, placed this crisis is a public health perspective. So that's why my, my initial analysis that I share with public and I also share with government is actually a comprehensive analysis of the economic costs by modeling by taking, uh, taking into account that the content measure may have effect on the short term economic effect agenda, but also actually beneficial in terms of the long run and medium effect. Because if you don't contain properly this uh, crisis, then you will have a permanent impact, which actually will also uh, give you a constraint on future growth. Not and then the not and also if you have 
like catastrophic fatality. Uh, economic is about welfare, not about economic growth. But in many government across the world, they forgot. So when I introduce, for example, that economic costs should include the value of statistical lives to those scenarios. So that people start to see, well, this is the economic cost, the true economic cost. You have to include the cost of the avoidable, preventable life. And then you aggregate it over 10 or 20 years and then measure in, in the frame, a better framework of cost benefit analysis and people start seeing this. And the Indonesian government uh, start realizing that, although a bit late, but so, so now uh, we are, I think we are, we are better uh, looking at the, uh, you know, looking at the perspective that is also long run. So I think that's my, my view. <clears throat> Uh, also, if I if I may, uh, there is some question uh, about uh, about the, sec uh, the services sector. For example, services sector uh, is is very heterogeneous, and then actually Kunal and the NI has actually another line of research which 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 we discuss about structural transformations and how it affects inequality, and where how this particular sector actually has correlation with inequality and, and, and we address, we acknowledge that the within sector distribution is also matter. So I just want to give a remark that this analysis actually is still ignoring the within sector distribution because in within sector, within sector, we have finance sector, but in Indonesia, many of the services sector is actually trade sector, which is quite informal and they import very much uh, people at lower income society, people. So I think, uh, I will update in this analysis in the near future, and maybe I don't know, maybe I can share it with everyone. That would be fantastic. Thank you. On that note as well, I will just mention um, that uh, everybody will receive an email um, with the recording of this podcast. Uh, sorry, the recording of this video webinar, uh, and that will also have a link to the slides that have been shown here today. Um, the videos and also the research uh, that Andy particularly presented that is a wider webinar, a wider paper as well. And uh, we can also include some links to some of the other relevant research to some of these questions. Now we just have two minutes left, so uh, we'll take a final question here. Um, let's uh, just take this one. We've got uh, Aliyah Khan and she says, do you think that there will be a push for formalizing the informal sector in order to extend the social protection coverage to unregistered informal economy workers? So I would be like to take that one. Before Andy, maybe I will have a comment a bit. As I, as I suggest before that Indonesian now is, Indonesian social safety net system is under heavy pressure. Why the heavy pressure? Because we, we are now have to consider all this million, million decile beyond poverty decile or ten, one decile. And in this, uh, region of vulnerable people, there are so many informal sectors. Uh, we are now starting to look at the informal sector, people who work in informal sector, in uh, motorcycle, you know, taxi, uh, because they also need it. Now we are start giving cash to them. We are start giving cash to them. Those people no, are not traditionally within the social safety net system. So we are not thinking of doing it, we are doing it. So this is informal people. So we are not thinking of doing it, we are doing it and I really appreciate what the government has done here. So I think this will be a good uh, milestone yeah, in the improving of the innocent social safety net system to take into account that. Whether or not it will lead to more formality of the sectors, well, that's another issue, but at least we're giving them cash and then I'm sure this is a good step. Uh, can I just uh, say about, uh, so several questions on country specific estimates. And I can say here actually that Andy is working with his co-authors on this. Hopefully we should have a working paper on this very soon because obviously there are really important questions about within the region effects, depending on whether you're a commodity exposure or, or some or country land on tourism and so on. And uh, Andy is obviously working on this sorts of issues. So hopefully we'll have a working paper on that uh, very soon. I should also mention that Andy and Arif also have a paper in Indonesia uh, on looking at structural transformation, inequality, and inclusive growth. 
on our website. In the, well, and so that's our paper you should look at, which essentially examines the relationship between social transformation and inclusive growth uh, in a way that perhaps uh, hasn't been done before. And that's worth looking at too. Um, I just want to end, uh, if I may, Ruby, uh, to say that we should also mention the next webinar, which is going to happen on the 2nd of June by Professor Yuen, Yuen Ang. Um, and uh, so uh, please do join us virtually for that webinar. Registration details are already possibly online uh, soon. And we look forward to seeing you there. And thank you so much, Andy and Ari, for your presentations. And uh, the, really the big question at the end is to think about what should rich countries do? Going, given what we're seeing now on the percent potential increase of poverty in terms of how they can provide support to the to the poorer countries and that's a bigger there's a big question that they need to think about thank you so much all of you and we can start the webinar now thank you bye-bye